Big Questions with the Dead Milkman. Welcome to Big Questions. So this is the question. What is your opinion of record producers? How have they helped or hindered recordings you've been involved with? Is there a producer given the chance that you'd like to record with someday? Um, I don't mind. My, my opinion of record producers is that when they do the job well, they're very valuable. <laughs> And otherwise, you could probably do away with them. But, <laughs> but they are very like doctor. So if a doctor does the job well, I'm okay with him. But if, if he gives me an appendectomy through my nose, no, probably not. Not a good doctor. I, my my idea of a producer that does his job well, a good producer is someone who understands the goals the artist wants to achieve and helps them achieve it. And maybe helps them to see something from a better, a different perspective. They can improve the, the final product, the song or the album of songs or whatever it is. Um, for me, I have. I don't think I've ever really been hindered by a record producer, but who knows? I've had the fir the first album that we did, Big Lizard. I think we we thought. Uh, the engineer was the producer, or at least I did, I don't know. It was our, my first time in a recording studio, and that was John Wicks, um, who had just happened to own the studio we went into to, with our money and said, we want to record some songs with you. Um, he didn't really act as a producer, except maybe a little bit here and there. He helped us get the job done and we gave him credit as a producer. We basically recorded everything like we would at a show. And the only overdubs we did, we didn't, we didn't do overdubs to replace anything that was recorded just to enhance it, maybe a guitar to make it thicker sounding, playing the same thing that the guitar already played. Uh, we might've done vocal overdubs. I'm, I don't even remember exactly how that worked. Um, I think some vocal takes were done over again. Um, we definitely did Bitch and Camaro live. <laughs> that was not <laughs> overdub take. But then we we decided to work with John Wicks again. In fact, he kind of scolded us for calling him a record producer when he wasn't for that album. But he agreed to take us into a studio for our second album, Meet Your Paisley, and be a real producer. And then we found out this is his style probably didn't mesh uh, with all of our, with us, especially not with Dave, who can't speak for himself now, but I do recall. <laughs> yeah, he was not particularly happy. Um, <laughs> angry moments <laughs> so, <laughs> between Dave and John. But what, what John did on our second album, he had us record live again, like, like he did on the first album, except with the intention that only the drums would be kept uh, and we would record everything. We record everything again over with headphones on, listening to the drums, um, with the in the same room that the drums were. I should have said on on the first album, our, the guitar the guitar was in a closet to separate itself from the drums for better. I guess they did that for mixing purposes for better control over guitar effects or whatever you want. The bass was in a separate closet. And Rodney was in a separate room. In a closet. So. <laughs> it was actually a closet, right? Could call it a closet. Uh, and then the only time I was with Rodney in that room was when we did the Chicken Barrel. Um, then, so when we did Eat Your Paisley, only the drums were kept and everything else was recorded again. The at pressure's on me. I have to get it right the first time. <laughs> yeah. Well... First, we would do three or four tapes. I know, I know. Choose the one that the drum sounded best on. Was that yeah, the in our first album? We just that, kept mistakes in. We was didn't that the problem, problem that Dave was having with him? That was, was the problem playing? Dave was having. I got used to it pretty quickly. I must say, I didn't have too bad a time using headphones. But Dave did. Dave hated it. He would have rather just been live with us recording. And he also had a problem with John 
wanting him to play fingers on some songs like air crash museum or something where he said this would sound better if you play and dave refused <laughs> uh and i think he compromised and used a felt pick for some things that, so we wouldn't get that clicky clicky sound of which is dave's style of sound anyway uh so when what we decided we weren't gonna use john wicks again and we were on tour for eat your paisley and we had some shows with the band glass eye and i remember dave complaining to brian about you know the recording process he it's you know how how we do it why can't we just record as a live band and brian said you can record as a live band and make it sound good whereas john was saying well it won't sound as good if you record as a live band and i think it sounds better there's I some truth I to what john better. said and some truth to what to to brian's method as well um i think john was wanting it to he actually made us sound more live even though we weren't live because of the room sound that he had us all play we were all playing in the same room really just re mixing it back together you know acoustically live but dave wanted us to be have that live feel that he couldn't get unless he had the drums i guess they're playing real loud and live for him to play against which i could understand too so i like I thought Brian was the best producer that we worked with personally, because not only did he let us do things the way we wanted, but he also had ideas that we didn't have for instrumentation. And, and uh, I think he, he understood us and, and understood our goals and actually pushed us farther than we would have if we just self-produced our thir third album, which was Bucky Flamini. The Bond Wizard. <laughs> one was it. and we we did three albums with brian and then we did one with ted nicely who had a totally different approach very heavy-handed he was another he was a producer that was i guess like john wicks who had his own way of doing things and that was the way that it would be done and i had a little problem with that but i do think in the long run he made a really good sounding record and he pushed me farther than i would have as far as my guitar playing goes I would think I did something just good enough or as well as I could do it, and he would not accept it. <laughs> not good as got not good enough for the Germans, though. Not good enough for the Germans. <laughs> he understood the Germans. <laughs> and so yeah, that's my that's my take on producers. Um given the chance, I would love to work with a producer that we mentioned many times on this program, uh Brian Eno. I would love to see what he would do <laughs> in the <laughs> minute. It would probably be a disaster. But just for the just for the experience, it's probably um it's not gonna happen. I know. I always like the idea of recording live. I always thought it'd be great to take a band and let's say you've got like seven songs or something, make them run through it, go rehearse and rehearse it for weeks and weeks. So you have those songs smooth, like you would play it live and then just get them in and record it. That's the way I, you know, and if you want to over overdub. Tough titty, you missed it, and and that's the way it is for life. But that's how albums used to be. They were, you know, they had these little glorious mistakes and stuff like that on them. So, yeah. Have you seen um, that get the get back documentary? No, I'm not going to watch that because I'm too busy listening to new music, and I'm not a putz. <laughs> All right, I'm done. I think we did. A, I want to hold your dog almost entirely live. It was an overdub or two of guitar, I think. I think we did that in like one take. And the only reason the guitar was overdubbed is because the Germans insisted on it. <laughs> ah, you Germans! <laughs> yeah, um, on my, all those later albums. We did Methodist Coloring Book Live and with no overdubs. <laughs> Who's next? Um, it's my turn. Yeah. Um, I, I don't think I've ever actually worked uh <clears throat> with a producer i was trying to think about it and i was thinking well joe nicolo with you guys a couple years ago mm -hmm. um and he definitely uh is amazingly skilled at what he does i still wonder what the difference is between engineer and producer i don't know if anybody could ever explain that um i know like steve albini makes sure there's a distinction at least in credit um Although I think what he does is very much a producer thing because he has 
specific things like he doesn't use digital anything and he mics them in a weird way um which to me kind of seems like it's uh more of a producer kind of thing um where the the band has an idea like joe was saying like they have a goal or whatever and a producer has an idea of how it's going to sound it could be totally different than what the band was thinking um and then you have, you know, producers like the guy that does those Radiohead albums that any other band he does, you still hear those like <laughs> sounds, you know, like, oh, that's that guy. Um, that's that guy. But yeah, the, the, the only time I think I worked on an album that had a producer was the Low Budgets uh, third album, Leave Us Alone. And Brian Springer was producer and he did a damn good job, in my opinion. He had a lot of input for... Uh, like percussion or backing vocal things and like different sounds. Um, but yeah, I mean, other than that, um, I've, I've always been curious what it would be like to have someone step in, especially with us, like a fifth person. I mean, Brian McTeer uh, at Minor Street, um, I thought he was great, or I think he's great because he would kind of, he seems to have this kind of like threshold of like ah, i don't know guys <laughs> um and he's usually i think we've always ended up agreeing um but i i do like that role in general where they're doing the technical stuff and the recording and they give their input of like oh that that note is uh, or that string's out of tune or something like um but brian brian didn't work as a producer with us or with the low budgets right when, when he works as a producer he i think it caught well it costs more money for one thing and I think, but I think that in that role. kind of in that kind of scenario, they're like the de facto producer, though, because they could make it sound fucked up if they wanted to. They could like overmodulate my, you know, they could just kind of mess with it. Um, so yeah, I would I would like to see what it's like to work with a producer who's kind of more rigid. Just curious to see what um, that what would happen. Who would punch him in the face first? <laughs> but any anyone in anybody in particular um i would i would like to work with steve albini because um i i like that concept of of um not that it's raw but that you know there's kind of um i don't know there's a different feel to albums that he works on but again he does he's not a producer so my answer i don't know roy thomas baker is dead right is he Mm -hmm. I can't remember. Um, Phil Spector, oh, he's dead. He's dead. Yeah. <laughs> we already yeah. talked about him. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, that's my answer. Uh, <laughs> never worked with a producer, Brian Springer. Okay, but was Brian working as a producer or just a member of the band who had some ideas for the songs? He wasn't um, a member of the band. No, he wasn't? Okay. He, he oh, was working oh, yeah. as a producer. Right. He did play drums with us however many years ago that was where we did a thing. Okay. But, yeah. He was kind of the fifth low budget. He he toured with He did, like, roadie jobs with us, but he didn't drive. Okay. That's right. Steve was the drummer, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, what was I going to say? Um, I'm fine with record producers. I like to collaborate with people when we when making music i think it always leads to some more interesting things um, i do like making music on my own but i also like collaborating with people because i think you know the clash of ideas can lead to some interesting things um uh you know producers act as like another set of ears for what you're working on i think maybe sometimes bands can work on something over and over and over again in isolation by themselves and not realize that maybe they're doing something that is not quite right. I don't know, you know, whatever right means. Um, I wouldn't mind working with Brian Beatty again. I think he has, like Joe said, I think he had some good ideas and he, we, he was easy to work with. I think he was as strange as we were. <laughs> um, and you, you guys, you, you brought up Brian Mateer. I Yeah, I guess he really wasn't technically a producer, but I think he did have some input on the way we did certain things in the studio. And, you know, I think he's a great guy and, and would love to work with him again at some point. Um, but 
Yeah, it's kind of hard to define a producer, you know, sometimes. I think maybe the, the most produced producer producer that we've used was maybe Ted Nicely because he insisted on like rehearsing with us and changing arrangements and that kind of stuff before we went into the studio, which I don't think anybody else has done with us. So maybe that's... But Brian didn't do that stuff? Well, I guess he did a little bit, but Ted was more structured and rigid rigid about that did you guys uh, have horns in mind for those those songs on that album yeah Yeah. the horns i originally i originally worked out the horns as ninth stabs oh shit now people are going to find out i know things um i originally worked out the horns as knights as ninth stabs and they were originally done using the uh scene the horns from the miami sound machine their horns they put out discs uh i i had the sampler then and and i Part of me was kind of partial to the disc. Even the guys in the, in the thing were saying, those horns sound pretty good. But uh, um, yeah, that's what I still have. I have that disc somewhere, the Miami Sound Machine horns. That's whose horns I used as the samples. But I, that was arranged, and then they came in and played. And then, they, But they did the solos and stuff. Like I had the little blocks in there and stuff. Yeah. I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying I'm, I, you know, I totally arranged the horns. Just and, then, and then, uh, Dan, you mentioned Joe Niccolo, who he's a lot of fun to work with and, and, you know, I'm looking forward to working with him, with him again. We, I know we have something coming up with him um, sometime soon, but um, I just have to look back at my notes here. And it's like, it looks like I mainly like producers named Brian, Brian McTeer, <laughs> Brian. <laughs> um, so does that, you know, like Joe said, like, does that mean that I would like to work with Brian Eno? I don't know. I don't think so. I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, I don't, I'm fine with record producers. I think it's an interesting concept. Brian Adam. Okay. <laughs> can I, can I, am I up? Cause I got a question for you guys. Yes. How the fuck did we make it this far into this video without someone saying more cowbell? <laughs> how can you, how can you do a whole video about, look, it's the first thing on my notes. Look, <laughs> more cowbell. Okay. It's right. It's, it's above call Pete Ducey a stupid SOB. <laughs> now I don't even get to do that. Hopefully somebody will call him Pete Ducey a stupid SOB this week. I can catch the news. I'm, I'm hoping somebody will. Um, okay, for you non-musicians, and if you non-musicians made it this far, thank you. Um, if for you non-musicians, I'll, I won't explain the way I explain what a producer, music producer does to most people. I see a producer as like a director of a movie. And so when you talk about an engineer, to me, the engineer is like the crew, the person who works the camera, the sound. Most people can kind of envision this. And the director is the guy that kind of comes in and has the vision. And different music producers are like different directors. For example, Stanley Kubrick is a son of a bitch to work with. I mean, he is a hard, he, he basically made Shelley Duvall have a complete breakdown. He's not fun to work with. But he makes art. He makes really, really good movies. Now, to do this, he does some, some you know, ridiculous things. Like, he made Scatman Crothers do the scene where he gets the axe to his chest and falls down. He made him do it, like, 70 times. And Scatman Crothers was like, Mr. Kubrick, what do you want from me? So Wait, this is going to actually kill me. <laughs> yeah, and, and so that's kind of like Phil Spector with Johnny Ramone. Phil Spector made Johnny Ramone play the same note over and over again. He was being a Kubrick. Then there are other directors like Adam Sandler. Adam Sandler makes a movie, and it's fun for everybody. Fun for the cast, fun for the crew. They're all of his friends, but it's a load of shit. I mean, it is a steaming pile of garbage. And this is kind of like the producer that wants to be everybody's friend. The music producer wants to be everybody's friend. So somebody comes in and goes, hey, my nephew gave me this kazoo, and he really wants me to play it on the album. Like, can we take out the guitar solo and put it? And this guy's like, yeah, yeah, sure. Anything you want, buddy, as long as you're having fun, you're, you know, and, and, those albums are generally not that good. What you need in a music producer is a David Lynch. Because David Lynch will look at you and go, you know what? Let's try it. Let's try taking out the guitar solo and putting in the kazoo. And if it doesn't work out, we'll have to kill your nephew. That is what you need. (laughs) That is totally, totally the best kind of producer to be. So think of an album is is kind of like a movie or a play. Like, you know, you and your friends would get together and, and you would write 
the dialogue and everything. And then, then you, you know, you're in front and say, Oh, I'll act on this part and I'll do that. And then you get your, you know, you get your play together and, or your movie, you work it all out. And then along would come the record company and they'd say, Oh, we've got a director for your, for your, you know, thing. And that director is the guy who directed Patch Adams. So that's kind <laughs> of the way it used to be. Like, I am so glad that we don't have to deal with record companies. We used to, damn, we used to have an on-running joke where we would do this record company guy going, listen, we got you a, a producer for your album. It's, uh, you know, Steve Lillywhite? Well, it's not him, but this guy is Lillywhite. Let me tell you, he is the one. And so, like, we, producers were just kind of assigned to people. It, it wasn't a great thing. So I'm pretty pleased they're gone. Um, and it, But the, the actual, like, annoying producers are still out there. Pre-COVID, and this never happened to me in clubs, but it would happen to me if I was out at like, you know, uh, like dinner or something like that, or a party where there were people. I'd always get the guy who won it, who'd come up and go, listen, I, I'd really like to talk to you about producing producing your album, which always meant the milkman and never seventh victim. And and I would say to him, I'd say, well, first thing you do is, and, and people lean in if you are a musician, this will save you a lot of fucking around time. I would lean in and say, well, what kind of music are you into? And here it would come. You go, well, I'm into some pretty obscure stuff. And I'm like, so am I. What are you into? He go, well, you've probably never heard of them, but bands like Deer Hunter and Bon Iver. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that's that's really out there, buddy. Oh, I'm going to be hiring you in a minute. People, if you come to me and you tell me you like those bands, I will kneecap you right before I curb stomp you. Um, as a general rule, ask if somebody wants to come and, and produce your band, ask them, you can ask them two questions. One of them not so relevant now in COVID. That question would be, what was the last band you saw in concert? But the other question is, what was the last bit of music you paid for? And I just, I have here, I'll show you folks, I've got my, um, my Bandcamp app. You know, there's so much more room on your phone once you take Spotify off of it. Once you get that off of there, you're, there's a lot more room on your phone. But this is, um, this is, I'm not ashamed of anything I was doing. This isn't a great song, but this is a Break Me Not by The Wake. So if I were, if a producer were to show me that, I think he'd probably be okay. So um, just a general um, where to go. Like if you, if you open up your phone and you've got Sleater Kinney on it, I will confiscate your phone and you'll never get that fucker back. You don't deserve that phone. Um, so I would, moving on with the producer thing, I would just like just once in this millennium to have a producer that I speak the same musical language with because I don't really get that uh, anymore. It used to be when you would produce or when you work with somebody you'd say can you make it a little less black flag and a little more butthole surfers and they understood what you were talking about because everybody had a common musical language. That for me is gone and it makes me very sad like I will say you know can you make it more like stiff valentine or maybe death proof and they, you know, I get looked at like I have lobsters coming out of my ears. No, it doesn't. It doesn't really make me gung ho for for making music. Um, that said, I will give you the names of the people I would like to work with. Um, the first person I would think of as a producer would be Neil Young, because Neil Young looks like the kind of guy who wouldn't take any shit off an evil corporation. I mean, I haven't seen the news this week, so I don't know what's going on, but it just seems like he, plus he made, he made that album Trans, which is fantastic. I really, I, I, I would, I would actually seriously really like to work with Neil Young. I like Neil Young. After that, and, and I'm going down through more likely possibilities here, um, John Fryer, uh, who we've mentioned on the show before. He worked with my friend, Jen Vicks, but John Fryer has worked from everybody from Fad Gadget to Angels in Agony. Uh, he has a band right now called Black Needle Noise that's really, really good. And most importantly, he was um, one half, along with Rebecca Cosboom from Strip Mall Architecture, one half of the band Dark Drive Clinic. And they made, oh, look, you see you guys' own reflection in this. Cool. Um, he, they made this album, uh, which is the uh, Noise in My Head, and it is one of the best produced albums, one of the best made albums ever. Um, it's not available. I have one of the few copies. You can't get it anymore. So I think Cop International has the rights to this. So if you if you work with Cop International and you're watching now, re-release this goddamn album because it's great. But this this is like a calling card for a producer. If you want to hear how something should be produced, get a hold of this. Of course, you can't. I would have to burn you the MP MP3s. But uh, just really really, really talented person. Um, after that, Brant Showers from Damon, which is often spelled Amon, um, and also uh, Solve, 
Um, he produced the uh, um, the Bestial Mouths album, the last one, which is fantastic. Um, of course, Flatliner, the Amon album, which a uh, piece of genius. And that was done in um, 2011. So it's good that, you know, he has at least 10 years worth of, of experience there, as opposed to, I guess, John Fryer's 5,000 years of experience. But he's still, and he would fit in well because he's the same height as us. He is, he would, he would just, you can slot him right in there and that would be fantastic. So I would, would like to work with him and again, speak the same musical language. Now, if we decided that we were going to make fun albums like we used to, you know, like, let's make, everybody goes, can't you make a fun album anymore? I got the idea. First, Brian from the Gossicles, all right? Enter this code for 30 lives. Up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right. B, A, select, start. Because um, the world owes him for that. Um, Brian from the Gossicles combined with MC Lars. They, first of all, a lot of people think they're the same person. But if you had those two sitting behind a desk, you know, sitting behind the deck and everything, running everything, I think... It would be it would be a great album, uh, you know, and I think it would be a fun album. And they they have a lot of musical history in their heads, <clears throat> so yeah, I would definitely say that. And then um, the final person that uh, um, that I would suggest to produce as someone I'd like to work with, me, because for years people would say, "Would you would you like to produce something?" And I say, "No, no, I don't I don't do the producer thing." And then one day uh, a friend of mine said, "I was saying about oh I don't do the producer thing." He said, "You you've been doing." remixes for about a decade at least right i'm like yeah he goes, yeah that's producing you putts it's the same thing plus here's the thing right i still have my integrity although i did do i did give a quote to rolling stone but i've been working hard to make that up and i promise i will never do it again uh and the other thing is if you look on my phone okay i've got the uh the midnight euphoria the camlin um single on there which would destroy anybody else that tried to listen to it so i would say yeah me Neil Young, we're, we're you know, it, it's a good deal no matter what you get. Okay. <laughs> so we're going to move to recommendations now. I'm recommending this week a documentary that came out in 2018. But then a couple of years ago, 2020, it was released on the streaming platform, Disney Plus. It's called Howard. And it's about Howard Ashman, uh, the lyricist, playwright, uh, screenwriter. He's the guy responsible for the, the, the musical, The Little Shop of Horrors, which was based on a movie from, I think, 1960, they said. Um, then it became a movie again based on the musical, but he wrote the book and the lyrics for that. Uh, that's probably his first big success. He also worked on Good God Bless You, Mr. Rosewater. But after, um, after a while, he was contacted by Disney and brought out to California, and he was the lyricist for The Little Mermaid, Beauty and the Beast, and Aladdin. And the film is he died in 1991, I think, um, of uh, AIDS, unfortunately. But the film is good at showing you um, his life through pictures, interviews, and uh, stories of his friends and workers. And you get to see a little behind the scenes at Disney of storyboarding Beauty and the Beast and Aladdin and the recording in the studio of those musicals. Um, I would like to recommend <clears throat> something that I believe Rodney has recommended at least once, maybe twice. It's a movie called I Don't Feel at Home in This World Anymore. I don't know why it took me this long to see it, but I finally watched it and it's great. Um, I don't know what I was expecting. I know there was at least one line I was expecting to hear. <laughs> <laughs> I um, threw it that hard. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I just, I really love the way that, like the, just the timing of it and just the rhythm of the entire movie is almost flawless. Um, just the buildup of the characters and their relationship. And then like how it all kind of culminates into this craziness toward the end, but it's still kind of like normal crazy. I don't know, it's a really good movie. Yeah. Check it out. And the guy who wrote and directed it is the star of the movie Blue Ruin. 
So there's a tie in with Blue Ruin and Green Room and all that great stuff. Uh, I would like to recommend two things. Um, the first is an iOS app uh, that just came out called Euclidean Sequencer um, by a developer called Four Pockets. Um, Euclidean Sequencer is an alternative uh, incarnation of like the step sequencer. Um, it's based on Euclidean rhythms, um, uh, which are kind of like Greek, Greek mathematics algorithms. Um, it's hard to explain, but they, they, they create some sort of harmonious random rhythms that you can play against each other. Um, and this is a four track sequencer for your iOS device, like your, well, I think it's specifically for iPads. Um, it's really cool and it's easy to use and I recommend you check it out. Um, and then the second thing, um, we'll flash a picture of it right now. I don't actually own this, but I think I might uh, get one. It is a uh, denture drill bit holder. So it looks like a set of dentures, but it's got slots so you can put all your drill bits in it. It looks really cool. <laughs> I want that. To, oh, oh my Brilliant. God. <laughs> so look at the picture of it. Um, right? No, there. I don't know where you're going to have the picture. Um, and uh, we'll provide a link for where you can order that. It's really cool looking, and uh, I'm going to order one. That's it. I'm going to hold up the Camland single while I while I talk. Then uh, my recommendation for you this week is that you Frankenstein the shit out of something. So I'm going to have to go back and explain that. Um, there's a company called the LFO Store, and they make patches for different uh, 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 synthesizers. And I bought some patches for them for my uh, Uno synth. I have it right here, and um, and I got on their mailing list. So I see him checking my email, popped in the other day, and it said, Yamaha TX81Z FM Depths sound set. And I thought, oh, my God, the Yamaha TX81Z is pretty much the same thing as the Yamaha DX11. So if you watch the show, you know that um, one of our, our viewers was kind enough to hook me up with a DX11, and I put a whole new battery in it, and that was, it was an intense saga. So I wrote, the, I wrote them back, and I said, is this compatible with the DX11? And then within a few days, a guy wrote me back and said, oh, yeah, basically he got a hold of a TX-11 and said, so I got to buy them now. It was only like 17 bucks, but I bought them. Uh, and then once you get them, I had to get them from the computer because they're SysX files over to this old piece of hardware from the 80s. So uh, when you do that, folks, you're going to need a set of these. These are MIDI to USB cables. I've got tons of them in case anything happens. I always have quadruple redundancy. And you're going to need a thing called MIDI OX or MIDI OX, as I call it. It's a free program, but donate. Don't be a cheapskate. Throw a few bucks at them. Uh, and then that will help you move one from the other. So that's the not exciting part of why you're going to Frankenstein the shit out of something. So after I was, as I was getting ready to do it, I realized, wait a minute, if I do a whole dump of these SysX files, I'm going to wipe out everything. I kind of need to back everything up. There's only, this is a piece of equipment from the 80s, the DX11. So there's only so much room on it. It'll only hold like 32 of your own files. Everything else is preset. But what I did have from the 80s was I did have um, this awesome um, cartridge. So what I did was, I Frankenstein, but it was dead because the battery lasts for about 10, maybe 20 years. And this thing, again, I've had it since the 80s. So I Frankenstein in a battery. Now, there, originally, I didn't put it inside because there's all these videos, or at least a couple of them, where somebody will say, and then I just put a battery inside, but they never show you them soldering it in because it would just be about four hours of them going, son of a bitch, more like Peter, do you <laughs> stupid son of a bitch. So, it's, um, it just cuts, it just goes, and then I soldered a battery in. So I tried that and it was a bit of a nightmare. So I wound up just drilling two holes through. Again, I wish I had the denture drill bit and then running it out to the external battery. But I did not, this is what I'm saying. I didn't clip, uh, normally I would just clip this and make it shorter and make it nice and neat afterwards. But then something kind of philosophical hit me with this. I thought it looks ugly, but it works. It's not pretty, but it works. So I'm going to leave it like this. And then every time I look over there, and now, by the way, I've got like four banks on this. I can store a lot of shit, but I can look over there and I go, all right, there's this thing from the 80s that I brought back to life. And again, not pretty, but it works. Like me. 
<laughs> Thank you. Oh yeah, I start my job soon. What's your job? I'm so I'm going to be like facilities manager of a church. So it's kind of like the sexton job, but I'm in charge of the sexton. Salary position. A different church. I revolt. <laughs> what, Joe? A different church. Yes. That's good. Is it the Unitarians? It's Episcopalian. Oh, <laughs> you know that old joke where the guys decide, oh, the two drunk guys decide to get religion. And then they, um, so they start, they start trying to run into different places going, baptize me, baptize me. And they see, they run into like a Catholic hospital or something. And they run up to like one of the, you know, the sister thing. It's just, they're like, baptize me. And she's got like this, this um, bedpan and she freaks out and throws it on them. They're like, we're baptized. And they run out. And the one guy says, hey, we forgot to ask her what we got baptized as. And the other guy goes, I think we're Episcopalian. <laughs> <laughs> It's a true story. It happened in 1972 in Oklahoma. I'll ask him about it. Um, ask him congrats, about it. Dan. Congrats on the Thanks. new gig. Yeah. Neil Young is right. Neil Old is wrong. Rest in peace, Thich Nhat Hanh. Yeah. Delete Spotify. I never got it to begin with. 